All right, uh, speaking of getting hot, the next few weeks after this, woo, we're going to have some fun. But today will be good. I'm not saying leave. But, man, I, I've been looking forward to a long time because we're, we're in a series called Opportunities and Threats, Advancing God's Kingdom in the Midst of a Cultural Earthquake. And so starting next week, as long as I don't go too long today, we are going to start looking at the threats that are coming at us in the context of our state. And then the next week, it's going to get our nation I might get stuck there for a few, and then it's going to go to the world. So, oh, but this, ah, oh, God's word is so relevant to every problem every, we ever face. Like Ryan said, 2,000 years ago, but just as relevant today. So, man, so looking forward to it. And it's all part of the same series, and we're, we're talking about local mission today. And it's all in the same vein as we're in the midst of this cultural earthquake that you can all feel that as long as you're awake here, you're, you're feeling it. There is just some, some unsettling stuff. It feels like the ground is shaking. But what's key to notice is it's, it's not stopping. And so while our gut instinct is to duck and cover when the world shakes, like a normal earthquake, right? You go duck and cover. My, my, little, my little man who's eight years old was telling me about, I don't know how, how it came up this week, but it did. Maybe because we're doing homeschool, and he's like, where do I duck and cover? What, where do I get under? But he's telling me about how last year they had a real earthquake, and, and he shouted out to everybody, duck and cover. He was the first one, and he felt like a leader, you know, because he's like, everyone was screaming, but I shouted duck and cover. You know, he's like proud of himself. I was like, did he duck and cover? Yeah. So it was just this cute little moment, but it reminded me of these, you know, what we're talking about right now. There was that natural human instinct when things are scary, when things are shaking, to just take cover. But what we're looking at in God's word is the truth that there are certain times that in the midst of this shaking, you should not duck and cover. That in fact, there's so much spiritually charged energy, if you will. I'm not trying to, you know, speak in weird language, but just the reality that so much is stirred up. There's such a clear conflict right now. I, I see, I believe, in between good and evil, where God is desiring to break through, where the Spirit of God is wanting to move and bring awakening, bring revival, bring transformation. You can see that in some of the stuff that, that Sean Foyt is doing right now, where he's going into places that are the most literally physically dangerous in our country right now, and he's just setting up outdoor worship. And thousands of people are showing up. Hundreds are getting saved. And there's this hunger for God right now in the midst of, the, in the midst of crisis. And, and that's encouraging. That's, that's a confirmation of prophetic words. It's a confirmation of this sense that I'm talking right now. It's a confirmation of what a lot of people have been praying that in the midst of the, the tumult of 2020, God will move in incredible ways and is moving. And so we want to be a part of that. But we got to be equipped for that. We want to get equipped and continue to get equipped because if we're listening to certain things, man, this world right now is just so scary, we've got to duck and cover. Come out in a few years. But that's not going to work. Hebrews 10, 39 says this. To a church that was in crisis and going through some serious hard times, the author, one of their leaders says, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. See, that's interesting. In the midst of a crisis, while shrinking back might feel like a self-protection measure, in this case, he's saying, if you shrink back, you're going to be destroyed. And so sometimes, even though when it's scary, it's time to go on the offensive to actually protect yourself. And so that was a good word then, and it's a good word now. We're going to look into some more of the specifics we have been. Not just going to talk in generalities here, but we'll get real specific. Acts 1.8 is a good guide here. As we're talking about wanting to be a part of advancing God's kingdom. Jesus gave some a picture here of going out into all the world. In Acts 1.8, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Sumeria and to the end of the earth. 
So there's almost like concentric circles there, if you will, going outward. And we've intentionally been looking at that, those circles, if you will. Our first week was all about looking in the mirror. And in the midst of crisis, instead of looking outward first to blame others, we look to take personal responsibility. God, how do you want to grow me? How do you want to work on me? How do you want to challenge me or change me? And that strength to do that is because we know our identity is secure and it's not based on performance. But anyways. And then the next week, in week two, we looked at the reality of the crucial nature of community and where we have got to keep church going even when two or three gather God's word says in Jesus name he'll be there and so the importance of those relationships being maintained they are such a source of life by God's design that to stay isolated to stay alone is so dangerous and in fact 40 percent of Americans right now in this health, in this crisis have said according to some very trustworthy surveys 40% of Americans say they are going through a mental health crisis right now. That's very significant. As we've seen drug use dramatically increase, alcohol abuse, the suicide, suicidal ideations. We went through all those statistics grounded in science, which all affirms God's word. You need each other. So, so moving out. And now we're moving out another circle, if you will, into Jerusalem, looking at the local mission. How do we stay mission-minded when the world says shut everything down and when the world is shutting many things down? How do you stay mission-minded? That's, that's a real challenge. That's a real threat. Because the natural instinct is, again, just take care of myself. And while God wants you to take care of yourself, as we're looking at and there's an outward-minded mission that never stops. That's what we were looking at this week, and we'll do it one more week right now. So let's go to Matthew 9, 35. Jesus is teaching his disciples, his followers, about some core things, about being others-oriented and being mission-minded. He said this, Matthew 9, 35. When Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest this is just a hugely encouraging picture from Jesus about the heart of God when we're thinking about mission we can anchor ourselves in some core truths and this first one goes back to the very nature of the heart of God which is that the harvest is plentiful. You think about mission. What is God doing in the world? What can I do to be a part of God's kingdom advancing? And we've got to root ourselves in this simple truth that the harvest is plentiful. Why? Because God is always at work. God's spirit is at work preparing hearts, drawing people, wooing people, beckoning them through a variety of ways. And so we don't have to fear that, oh, I guess God's probably forgotten about mission right now. I guess God's not at work. I guess everything has to shut down. we got to stop all outward mission work. No, not at all. Because we're not the ones that generate it from the first place. Creation itself is a missional act by God. The old great saint Jonathan Edwards says, it's no fault of a fountain to overflow. That's where creation comes from. God wasn't lacking anything. He doesn't need us. Like the fountain that just overflows with goodness. 
created the world, created us to be with him, to share in the goodness of God, to share in the relationship with him. And that outward flowing fountain never stops. God is constantly at work in the world, in people's lives. And what Jesus so beautifully invites us into is so simply join God. It's not the spirit of God at work that's lacking. It's oftentimes harvesters, laborers just aren't paying attention, aren't willing to jump on board. And so we root ourselves in this truth when we look at, when we look at local mission, that there's nothing that's going to stop God's agenda. Nothing's going to change God's agenda. God's not going to be like, oh, that looks too hard. Yeah, okay, I've stopped my heart that cares for people. I've stopped my heart of compassion that wants to save and heal and deliver. I would say now more than ever, God's going to look just as Jesus did here on the crowds who are harassed and helpless without a shepherd, and his response is not, well, I'm going to wait till it blows over. Compassion, that gut level, this is not okay. God has better to save, heal, and deliver. So flowing from that heart, let's get to today's two truths about mission. I want to read Matthew 10, 1 to 15, which is the, the passage right after Jesus talks about the harvest, and then he sends out his disciples into the harvest, and we'll look at a couple core truths from there. So verse 1. So Jesus called to him his 12 disciples. They gave, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12, we're going to skip those. We read them last week. You know the 12. If you're not, you can read them. The 12, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no sound of the town of the Samaritans. So he had a specific mission for right now. Later it was Gentiles and Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is the same gospel that Jesus preached. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, which is the same works of power that Jesus did to demonstrate the kingdom at hand. You received without paying, or you received freely, so freely give. Acquire no gold or silver or, or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey. This is weird. Or this gets like, what? Don't take a bag with you? Don't take two tunics or sandals or a staff? For the laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there till you depart. As you enter a house, greet it. Say, shalom, it's the peace of God. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your work, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Looked at that last week. There's some very cultural stuff going on there. It's like, what is going on? So last week's message for that part. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town who ultimately rejects Jesus. So much going on anytime Jesus talks, but let's just bring out two things from there for today. Just core truths about mission that just should strengthen us in this time. That in the middle of a shutdown, that doesn't mean mission shuts down. In the middle of a shutdown, God still has a lot of mission going on, and we can participate with Him. And there's two things that help make that happen. One, it's so simple in here to be adaptable and available for God to show you new opportunities for mission when others have closed. So there's some, some things right now that are clearly closed. Those doors are closed right now. Where if, and even if we want to be missional for God, some, some stuff's just not possible right now. So what do you do when a door just seems shut? I was following God in this area, now the door's shut. What do you do? Be adaptable. Root yourself in this truth that the harvest is plentiful. God's spirit hasn't stopped working. The door is not shut because God's spirit is, has flown and left a place. God's spirit is at work. So if a door is clearly shut, I mean, there are some times when the spirit is saying, hey, I'm not here. But in general right now, all these doors are shut. That's not God saying, I don't care about mission. Our mindset's got to be, okay, how do I adapt? 
how do I stay on mission with God and adapt to what the situation requires? We see this in the disciples. Their ministry is not one-dimensional. They don't just have one card that they play, if you will. Their tool bag is full. It's full of all sorts of different stuff that represents Jesus so that when the opportunity arises, when the need arises, whatever the situation requires, they're able to dip into that tool bag, adapt, and bring something that represents Jesus. They're able to bring it in the truth of the message. The kingdom of God is at hand. How many of you guys know? That's not the only thing they said. They didn't just walk in somewhere and say, hey, the kingdom of God's at hand. Okay, well, see you later. That's a summary of all sorts of good news. So they were equipped to bring truth into the, the whole city. And that's a good challenge for us. As we see various threats coming our way, as we see people hurting in various ways, as we know that 40% of adults are having a mental health crisis, what's the good news that Jesus has to bring? Are you equipped and ready with good news, with an encouragement, with a challenge, with truth? That is, as the Bible says, it's, it's like salt for the moment. It's grace for the moment. You can have a good truth that's not grace in the moment. So that's part of being adaptable. It's being filled with truth. But they were also filled with different actions. They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They cast out demons. They healed afflictions. So what did they see? They saw different opportunities. It wasn't just a, a, a one-trick pony, if you will. This is all I got. They were adaptable to how they saw the opportunity for the kingdom of God to advance in certain people, in certain moments. The kingdom of God loves to come and loves to just transform. It loves to collide with the brokenness of the world. So sometimes you don't have to sit back and be like, oh, what's God's agenda? I have no idea. Because, you know, God hasn't told me yet. The disciples walk in and they see someone sick, they're like, that's not God's will. I'm going to pray for you. They see someone with a demon. That's not God's will. I'm going to pray for you. They see someone that's hung hungry. That's not God's will. I'm going to give you food. They see someone struggling, and the heart response is compassion. And they minister like they saw Jesus ministering. So they're adaptable. They're seeing what the, the moment requires and saying, I believe God's kingdom can break through. And so there's some mindsets for us that while some things get shut down, we stay rooted in this truth that God's always on mission. The harvest is plentiful. So I'm going to be adaptable and I'm going to look for opportunities where the kingdom can break through. And I want to have Tommy and Yuli come on up here. I'm going to have them share a, a quick testimony of how when you have the radar on, when you are adaptable in the situation, then we can continue believing that the harvest is plentiful and God's mission is at work. So if you don't know this, come on over here. If you don't know this awesome couple, this is Yuli and Tommy Segovia. Yeah, yeah. Are you guys happy to see them up here? Thank you. All right, so they're going to share. Who's starting? Rock and roll. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so we just wanted to share something that God has been doing in us um, for a while now. And um, I think collectively we can all, we've all shared some of the same experience of just feeling lonely and isolated these past few months. You know, there's been not being able to go to your place of work, not being able to spend time with family and friends. And um, for some reason, something that was really gosh I told myself I wasn't gonna cry okay something that was really hard for me was um family and especially parents and grandparents and um I lost my grandma a few years ago I didn't lose her like in a market right I mean like she passed away and um it it's still something that I'm dealing with and um Something that God was putting really, really heavy on my heart was um, for Tommy, whose grandma is amazing and 90 years young and is, is still a firecracker, was um, for, for to 
encourage and challenge him to really nurture that relationship. Um, despite the fact that we can't be near her, I mean, she lives down the street, and I think that's what really was really hurting my heart is that um, she lived down the street and we can't even go and spend time with her. And something for Tommy that I, I wanted him to really just know what a treasure that relationship is um, and to really invest in it as best as we can, however we can. So, if you want to. Oh, sure. Um, so, yeah, she was, uh, I think she had her, uh, you know, talking about a radar, you know, she had a radar on, I think, at the time. Um, this was a couple weeks ago. Um, just feeling like she needed to tell me, like, hey, you need to, you know, give her a call, like, and at least talk to her. And I kind of came in with all the, the excuses, you know, that you can, you know, of like, well, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't like talking on the phone very much, you know, and I've talked to her on the phone before, and it lasts, like, a minute, you know, two minutes, you know, and it's very, like, to the point, you know, and, and she's 93 years old, you know, and so she, she gets tired pretty easily, and um, uh, she's just very to the point on the phone, you know, and so I was like, well, you know, maybe not, and then, you know, kind of just thinking, like, well, if she's telling me to, like, you know, she's obviously got a radar on, I need to, I need to submit, you know, to that, and, you know, what's the worst going to happen, you know, it's like, it's on the phone, you know, she, she can't do anything to me, and she, she's always, she's always, uh, uh, what does she say, if you, like, spill something at a party, she's like, you're never invited again, you know, stuff like that, you know, uh, so she, she's, she's super funny, um, but she, uh, I give her a call, you know, and, and I'm at home, and, you know, we have a little extra time now, of course, because of um, uh, just COVID and everything like that, and um, so I got on the phone with her, and we ended up having, like, this this 30-minute long conversation, which is by far the longest conversation I've had with her on the phone, you know, and there was this, you could feel, like, this lightness, like, on the phone, like, talking to her, and she started, you know, I uh, started asking her, like, you know, do you need anything? Do you want me to bring anything? And she's like, you know, you know, your mom has been taking care of me, and my mom lives um, just down the street as well. And um, she was like, no, your mom's been taking care of me. And she's like, you know, I don't know where I'd be without your mom. And, you know, she means, she means so much to me, and I would probably be dead without her and all that stuff. And it was, it was very, not only did I feel that connection, obviously, from me to her of like, hey, I'm calling you, we're talking, you know, I'm encouraging you. Um, you could feel that lightness for my grandma, you know, but it was also for me, like, to be able to hear, like, her heart for my mom, you know, and where my mom has been this angel, you know, and that's, that's the word she described, like, your mom's an angel to me, and I don't know where I'd be without her, and how much I wanted to be that for my parents, you know, like, when they, you know, when they get old, and, you know, they're, they're a young 65 right now, I think, you know, and my dad always would joke and say, like, oh, well, someday you're going to take care of me, and I'm like, well, yeah, maybe, um, but uh, uh, I, it, that desire is blooming, you know, more, and just to be that same reflection, you know, and so from Yuli getting this, this from, from her own experience, you know, with her, her grandma, you know, and knowing how much that meant to her, and how much the, uh, she loves her grandma, and to be able to get that word from the Lord, to share with me, to be that light to my grandma, you know, and be used, you know, by the Lord to be that light for my grandma, which was also a light to me, which was also a light to my mom, you know, when, because my, she called my mom right after and was like, oh my gosh, I had this great conversation with Tommy, you know, and, and we talked forever, you know, and it was great, and see, forever is 30 minutes, and, uh, you know, she, it was just really good, you know, like all around, you know, and I feel like that's where God is, um, and I'm sorry, I know I'm going to go a little, a minute longer than you said, but um, I really feel like God right now is, he has this heart to heal physically, you know, and so we talk about COVID as a sickness, but he's, it's, right now it's not, you know, it doesn't really feel like it's a physical problem we have right now, it's a mental and a spiritual one, you know, and so God, I think, is wanting us to keep that radar on for, like, who is, who is emotionally broken, you know? Like, who is emotionally sick, you know, mentally, whatever it is. And um, the one that, the one, the verse that came to mind was, or story that came to mind was uh, just in a, a chapter before in Matthew 8, um, where it says uh, in, in verse 3 of chapter 8, Jesus reached, I'm sorry, it's in 2, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Lord reached out his hand and touched the man and saying, I am willing and be clean. And he was cleansed of leprosy. So even if you want to take it on a physical standpoint, like leprosy being the most 
contagious thing there was, you know, at the time, you know, where it was like, keep that guy away, you know, and don't touch him, don't look at him, no nothing, you know, and for Jesus to say, I'm willing, like, I'm going to break that, that barrier that we kind of feel right now, stay six feet, the whole deal, Jesus, not that Jesus was being disobedient to, that's not real or nothing like that, but he was like, I'm, I'm my God is bigger <laughs> than, than this disease, you know, and it's like, Leprosy being the most contagious thing, I'm willing to touch you and wipe it clean, you know, and have it be completely gone. And so if we can have our writers on to not only the physical stuff, but also the emotional of like, people are desperate for hope. Like they're desperate for someone to heal them, you know, emotionally. And we can be those things, whether it's your family, your friends, you know, if it requires you getting close to that person, like I, I'm, I'm not going to get into all the whether you should or not, but Jesus did, you know, <laughs> Jesus got close, you know, and I think that's where, that's where we've seen like the, that emotional toll that it's taken. And it's like, man, if you can, if you, someone comes to mind right now, just call him, like, just talk to him, you know, and we, we have the cure for this world. Like Christians have had it this whole time, you know, and it's like, we just gotta, we just gotta be willing, you know, to keep that radar on, you know, and so um, that's kind of our, our story in that, so. Thank you, guys. Love it. It's perfect. Willing, available, adaptable. That'll get it done. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So Jesus said, be available, be adaptable. All right, we're going to move on to the last point here that especially in times of crisis, God's mission will require sacrifice. Now, only the Lord can tell you what to sacrifice, but especially in times of crisis, God's mission will require sacrifice. When Jesus sent the disciples out, what did he say? Take no money with you. Take no bag. Don't even take a coat. Don't even take sandals. Don't take a staff. <laughs> There's a, so much wrapped, in up, wrapped up in there. You have to be, I mean, he called them to be vulnerable. To be so dependent on God that God would come through. But in that, there is so much sacrifice of what's comfortable. He tells them, go out, go on a journey, but don't take money. Why? Because Jesus' point is, because I want to teach you that God will provide. Go out. Don't take a coat. Why? I want to show you my provision. Go out. Don't take a staff to defend yourself on the dangerous roads. Why? Because I want to show you my protection. Now, again, these are not prescriptions for ministry all time. You never wear sandals. Oh, my gosh, you have shoes and you're a missionary, you know, heretic. It's not what Jesus is saying. But it's about this dependence. I'll put it this way. If we're trying to do mission with God and we feel comfortable, you're not dependent enough on God. If we don't feel dependent on God in what we're doing, then you're probably dependent on yourself. And I don't know about you, but when I'm out doing mission, like right now, if I'm feeling really comfortable on what I can bring to the table, it's not all that impressive doesn't change hearts, doesn't change lives, doesn't bring salvation, healing, and deliverance. There needs to be this, I'm dependent right now. <laughs> I can't do what I'm hoping to see happen on my strength. So Jesus intentionally puts them in a position that says, you're going to have to sacrifice of your comfort. You might even have to sacrifice of your reputation because you're going to go into places where you can get, you're going to get probably ridiculed. You're going to get rejected. I mean, Jesus even said it. Like, be prepared. Like, if, when they reject you, dust off the sandals of your, you know, dust off your feet and keep moving on. Let it go. Brush it off, as they say. But inherent is that is something, inherent in that is something almost none of us like, which is being rejected by people. Your reputation is, gonna, is going to suffer, Jesus said. There are going to be people that don't like you because of me, that don't like you because 
you challenge them that they need a savior that they can't do it all on their own and so Jesus up front as he's sending them out now here's the awesome thing he says I'm going to give you my authority I'm going to give you my power so if we can learn to walk that line where we let go of our reputation we let go of our strength we are willing to sacrifice those things so that we're dependent on him then Jesus says I'm giving you my power my authority my message my mission go out and do it and if we can get that challenging balance right if you will it's not really a balance exchange where we are willing to sacrifice then man that's where the kingdom advances in the most mighty ways and we can see this historically. We can see it in the scripture. We can see it in the testimony that Yuli and Tommy just shared. I want to share one really, really encouraging example from the, the historical volumes of church history. Especially in times of crisis, God's mission will require sacrifice. When you put together everything we've looked at of believing that the harvest is plentiful, being willing, believing there's divine appointments, believing God's at work, being adaptable, being willing to sacrifice and serve with compassion, especially in a time of crisis, we will see God's kingdom advance in a mighty way. And we see an example of this for really it's a couple hundred years in the fledgling church back in the second and third centuries where it was illegal to be church in the Roman Empire up until shortly into the, the third century or shortly into the fourth century actually in 312 when things started to change with some, some legal protections but until that those first 300 years it was illegal to the, the point of death to be a Christian in the Roman Empire and yet, some of you guys know the history, by 350, more than half of the Roman Empire was Christian. How do you go from zero to millions to take over the Roman Empire, if you will? A spiritual force that the world had never seen. And I want to share just one important piece of the puzzle that often gets overlooked. And it has to do with what we're talking about today in this being willing to sacrificially serve with compassion, being adaptable, how God uses it in such a mighty way. So in A.D. 165, there was a devastating plague that most historians now think was the first appearance of smallpox in the West. And it was a horrible epidemic where the historians estimate that a quarter to a third of the entire population of the Roman Empire was wiped out in a 15 year epidemic and then less than 100 years later in 265 AD another epidemic raged most likely the measles this time it hit the rural areas just like the urban centers in the prior one and these were, these were absolutely devastating but how the Christians responded in that hundred year period of, of two epidemics was absolutely instrumental in changing the whole course of human history, the whole course of, of church history. The heart to sacrificially serve Christ, serve others as Christ did, literally changed the world. How so? Let's read a little bit here. From this book called The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. Very, very good book. And there is a historian, Hans Zinzer, who specializes in uh, the epidemic, uh, or the, excuse me, the impact of epidemics on the world. And so he has this little quote that summarizes how the epidemics hit the Roman Empire and how most people responded in that time. He says, again and again, the forward march of the Roman Empire and world organization was interrupted by only one force against which political genius and military valor were utterly, hep utterly helpless, which is epidemic disease when it came as though carried by storm clouds all other things gave way 
and men crouched in terror, abandoning all their quarrels with one another, all of their undertakings, their ambitions, until the tempest had blown over. So that's his quick summary. But I want to give now some specifics of what that looked like in the Roman Empire for, talk about a a duck and cover mentality. So Dionysus, who is a Christian, the, the bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, which is a major, major uh, center of of Christianity in the Roman Empire at the time. He offered an explanation of what it looked like, the typical response, during uh, the second uh, epidemic. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, ran away from their family, in other words, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease, but do what they might, they found it difficult to escape. So that's a bishop of Alexandria. So maybe he's a little biased, right, in his description of how the typical Roman citizen responded. So there's, here's an interesting piece from a, a, the history books that Thucydides wrote about how Athens responded in a prior plague. So the same uh, kind of response here is affirmed. They died with no one to look after them. Indeed, they were many houses in which all the inhabitants perished through lack of attention. The bodies of the dying were heaped one on top of another, and half-dead creatures could be seen staggering around in the streets and flocking around the fountains for their desire for water. I'll, I'll just stop there. So, in other words, and this is, he goes on to say, this is very historically well documented, the average citizen of Rome simply fled when the plague came out of self-preservation and you know, quite understandably the, the prospect of being infected was lethal and so as anyone who had means so it's mostly it was the, the elite or the upper class citizens the, the politicians the, even the doctors the great Galen who's a famous classic doctor fled into you know, his house in the hills in Italy and so that was, the, that was the typical response. And so, you, so what happened, though, was these massive, just piled up corpses in the cities where people were dying because of the typical response of the Roman citizen in the face of this danger. However, the Christians, by and large, responded dramatically differently. I'll read a couple specific quotes. So this is from Cyprian, the bishop bishop of Carthage, who wrote in 251 during the second plague. And this is what he wrote. He wrote this to, to to his people about his church. So Carthage, a major city in the Roman Empire, he says, how suitable, how necessary it is that this plague and pestilence, which seems horrible and deadly, searches out the justice of each and every one and examine the minds of the human race. In other words, this tests our character. Whether the well care for the sick, whether the healthy care for the sick, whether the relatives dutifully love their kinsmen as they should, whether masters show compassion for their ailing slaves, whether physicians do not desert the afflicted. And he just goes on to continue along this lines. Such a radically stark contrast where it was seen as acceptable, normal, prudent, understandable when, man, the plague hits, run for the hills. And Cyprian is preaching something different. He says, this is a chance to test out what it means to be like Christ. He goes, although this mortality has contributed nothing else, it has especially accomplished this for the Christians and servants of God. We have gladly begun gladly to seek martyrdom while we are learning to learning to not fear death. Whew. That's that's what he was preaching. And then we'll, let's go to Dionysus. The, back to the bishop of Alexandria. Most of our Christian excuse me, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love 
and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another, heedless of danger. They took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. That was, talk about an opportunity. That was the opportunity that the early church saw in the midst of a threat like we have no idea. One third of the people in the, in, in the population died. That is, that's terrifying, right? So the human response is run away. And the early church saw an opportunity. They boiled it down to this. We can show the love of Christ to those who are suffering in the most tangible way possible. Which is what? Give them food, give them water, help them wash their hands and bathe. And something absolutely extraordinary happened that made people believe Miracles are happening among the Christians. And that was, and it's historically documented, that the mortality rate of the disease dropped dramatically among Christian circles to where it was almost like there was this supernatural presence of God to where, man, if you associated with a Christian, you were probably going to recover. You were probably going to get healed of the disease. Now, there... There, you know that we're all about supernatural healing, so there may have been a lot of that going on, but what they also did was just basic nursing, which we now know dramatically changes death rates. Give people water, and they might not die. Give people food, and they might not die. Wash their hands, and they might not die. So the Christians stayed, and they showed in Jesus' model this basic compassion for humanity. And it utterly transformed the empire that when the plague started the ratio of christian to pagan was one to 250 by the end of the second plague the ratio of christian to pagan was one to four from a statistical statistical standpoint that is a miracle in a hundred years that doesn't make sense now we can say yeah i'm sure god's spear was moving and there's miraculous things happening but it was also about on the very basic level showing compassion being willing to show a to sacrificially love one another it caught the attention of the of the emperors the emperor julian said this in a letter Sorry. There we go. Reread the chapter. So after the plague's over, there's another emperor, Julian, and this is what he has to say. He's not a fan of Christians yet. In fact, he doesn't like them. He pejoratively calls them Galileans, kind of like the what could good can come from Nazareth. So he writes a letter to the pagan priests. And he is so frustrated by the the Christian growth that's happening in the empire. His his message is, we need to up our game. For some reason, all these Christians, there's Christians all over the place. They're taking over the empire, essentially. And he says, basically, that we need to equal the virtues of the Christians. This is a direct quote in his letter. He says, the recent Christian growth was caused by their, quote, moral character. And then he says, even if pretended. So he's like, man, their character is changing our whole empire. Even if it's, they're pretending, it's working. Well, when you stay behind and are willing to die, you're probably not pretending. So anyways, but what the, is the specific of their moral character that is transforming this whole empire that he's so frustrated about? Quote, their benevolence towards strangers and care for the graves of the dead. 
I think that when the poor happen to be neglected and overlooked by us, the impious Galileans observed this, and they devoted themselves to benevolence. So he's trying to figure out what's going on. Well, they saw that we're doing a terrible job taking care of our people. We're just leaving them to die. So they saw an opportunity, and it's working. So they dedicated themselves to being nice to their neighbors. And the impious Galileans support not only their poor, but ours as well. Oh my gosh. They love people that are not Christians. What the heck? Everyone can see that, excuse me, because everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. It's, that's such an incredible testimony of a mad emperor. <laughs> testifying to what was changing the empire. And it was down to these incredible basics. Sacrificially serving with compassion in a time of crisis changed the whole empire. If you didn't hear it, as a result of the sacrificial compassion, by the end of these epidemics, the ratio of Christians to pagans or non-Christians in the Roman Empire changed from 1 in 250 to 1 in 4. And in some ways, that right there broke the empire. There was such a spiritual momentum after that that in the next 100 years... There became more Christians than anything else in the empire. From a statistical standpoint, and it's fun reading that book, they, they get into like movements and stuff. That it's like, as a sociologist, they're, they're like, that, this shouldn't happen. It's, it's, this kind of stuff, this is impossible in that amount of time to have such a dramatic effect. So what you see is that being able, being available, being adaptable, being willing to sacrificially serve. It was that simple. To serve with compassion during a time of crisis. It changed neighbors. It was one person at a time. It changed cities. It changed an empire. And it literally changed all of history. And it just got back to that question that, that so enraged Emperor Julian. If the church disappeared, would anyone outside the church care? If the church disappeared, would anyone notice? What frustrated Julian so bad was it's like these acts of compassion, these simple acts of sacrificial compassion. Everybody needs them because we're doing a bad job. We're not even taking care of our own people. These Christians take care of their own people and their supposed enemies. They're just taking care of everybody. It is sacrificial compassion, water, food, hygiene, prayer. And it literally changed the world. We have an opportunity in our world right now to think through what does it look like for us to be available what does it look like for us to be adaptable what does it look like for us to sacrificially serve with compassion what does it look like for us to root all of that in God's heart which is it's his mission the harvest is plentiful we can join him What does it look like to to serve in such a way where the emperors in our day get frustrated? Man, those Christians. We'd want to get rid of them, but everybody loves them. We're not doing a good job taking care of our people. They are. We got to get our act together. We got to act like them. I'm sure what they're doing is fake, but we got to act like them because it's working really well. These are just good questions as a church to be thinking through such opportunities. And I am not prescribing or trying to prescribe to anyone, this is how you need to sacrificially serve. Those are good questions. 
between you and the Lord, your family, your, your, your oikos, if you will, your tribe, your, your crew. But this example of the early church being willing to take so much that was dangerous, take so many threats, and dig into the heart of God to say, what is the example of Christ? How can we follow Jesus in this moment? And it took them to extraordinary places in their faith. They learned, as, as one of the bishops said, they learned in the middle of it. They were learning. And that's what threats can do. We can either run and hide or we can say, God, show me. God, teach me. I want to learn in the midst of this to seize the opportunities you put before me and be empowered by your spirit, willing to sacrifice, dependent on you for you to grow me so I can be a part of your mission. So while the world says shut it down, I believe the spirit of God is saying, follow me on mission. Let's pray along these lines. Heavenly Father, we thank you that mission is rooted in your heart. We thank you that you are the first missionary, the one who brought good news into the world about your love for the whole world, your desire to be in relationship with us, and the way you made for salvation, forgiveness, redemption, healing, and wholeness with you through Jesus Christ. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be filling us with a fresh perspective, a fresh fire, a fresh power that flows with your very heart for mission. And along, along those lines, I'm just just feeling like my wife's going to pray us out on those lines and lead us home full of your heart. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And this is the part that I feel like really applies to us. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear the Lord have no lack. I'm going to stop right there. Um, God, we thank you that right now, though times are unsettling and things can be scary and everything's kind of up in the air and they're wondering, and we're just wondering where to put our feet down because everything's kind of unlevel and changing and is that every, everything ever going to go back to normal? God, I thank you that we can put our feet, we can ground our feet in the firm foundation of you. We can let our hearts rest in you. We can let our hearts burn with fire for you. We can ask you to alight the inside of our beings with your hope that is ablaze. And so, God, I thank you that you are the remedy, that in every way that we feel that we are incapable and lack the capacity to even just handle life on our own, let alone be out on mission, God, I thank you that you are the answer. You are the remedy. You are the power. You are the hope. By your blood, we have all of our sins paid, all of our sickness taken away, and we come before you and we stand in agreement and we say yes. We say thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. 
Thank you for the healing of our diseases. Thank you for the transformation and the divine enablement where in our weakness, we are made strong in you by the power of the cross and your resurrection inside of us, making all things new and bursting out into the world, bringing your fire, your love, your goodness, and your transforming power. And so, God, I thank you for a mighty earthquake and for a birthing of your spirit, your power, your goodness in your believers across the earth right now. And that there would be a tidal wave coming out from each of the hearts and lives of your children. Where there is brokenness, I release your life, God. We thank you, Lord, for your life flowing over this nation and over this world through your beloved children. And we thank you that the world is going to, that this, this is such a time where the world is going to taste and see that the Lord is good through his children. In Jesus' name, amen. Dance like David.